ready for chapter 15? Go for it, Catherine. So we are on the other side of the Red Sea. The uh, Pharaoh and his army have drowned. What do we get? We get worship. Mm -hmm. um, we get the first song of the Bibles we've just been talking about. Um, and then, so we hear the song of Moses is first. And then what I think is really neat, we see the prophetess Miriam, who is Moses and Aaron's sister, uh, leads the women in worship with singing tambourines and dancing. Let me just say that Love the it. women's worship was exciting. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it. bring it. So, the Pentecostals got their got their time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes, there was there was interpretive mm -hmm. dance, all the things. I love it. Um, so moving uh, past the song of Miriam, they travel to they journey three days into the wilderness without finding water. Uh, they come to Marah and found water, but it was bitter, and so they grumbled to Moses. Moses cries out to the Lord. The Lord shows Moses a tree, which he threw into the water and caused the water to become drinkable. And the Lord made a statute and an ordinance with them at Marah, saying, If they will obey his commands, do what is right, pay attention to his commands, and keep all his statutes, then he will not inflict any illnesses on them like he did the Egyptians. And I have this quote, For I am the Lord who heals you. Then they come to Elam, where there were uh, 12 springs and 70 date palms, and they camped by the water. Very specific. Very yes. specific. <laughs> that must have been a nice place 12 to 12 and 70. Hmm. hmm. Interesting mm -hmm. numbers there. Interesting yeah. numbers. <laughs> yep. All right, okay. Rhonda, share with us about song. As Catherine said, this is the first song that's recorded in Scripture. There are 185 songs in, in the Bible. 150 of them are psalms. Lamentations is a set of five dirges. And the Song of Solomon is a love song. And the others are just scattered throughout. Um, scripture does not say explicitly that angels sing. Um, Job 38.7 says that the stars sang and the angels shouted. Uh, Luke 2.13 is... You know the story of the angels coming to the um, shepherds, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, "And saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom He is pleased." If you fast forward up to Revelation, uh, there are two different groups around the throne of God, and when He and it, Revelation five four says, "And we had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints." And they sang a new song. And then there were the angels uh, in Revelation five eleven, who say with a loud voice. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might. So, based on the scriptures that we've looked at, only the redeemed sing. It is a privilege that is saved for those who are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Amazing. The so, song of amazing. the redeemed. The song of the redeemed. That, that makes so much sense now. Yes. yes. <laughs> and this song that is sung in Exodus, it says in Revelation 15, 2 through 3, says this about the tribulation saints martyred by the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had won the victory over the beast, its image and the number of its name, were standing on the same glass with harps from God. They sang the God of the song of God's servant Moses and the song of the Lamb. Wow. So this song is what the tribulation saints will be singing around the throne of God. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing. That's amazing. That I mean, amazing. that is that is amazing. So we have it ahead of time. We can sing with them. That's right. Because we know the words. <laughs> we know the words. Just memorize chapter 15. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's amazing. But also um, how much, if you read it again or listen to it again, of how, with that perspective of how impactful that is right. as well. Well, and you think, when you think of God, you know, and you try in your little bitty tiny, you know, earthly mind to grasp who he is and what he is and how he should be praised and worshiped. And that privilege is ours alone as being redeemed by him. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, you know, he says the rocks will cry out if we don't, but that is a privilege that we get. And it's not it's not 15 minutes of standing up in the in the worship service. You, right. you know, I mean, yes. it's a, it should be a daily song that yeah. we sing to him and, and it just it just changes your whole concept of what worship is to know that that he's he, he loves us enough that he says mm -hmm. i'm gonna let you have the privilege 
of singing to me because I want to hear you. I want to hear your voice sing to me. Well, you I know, mean, it's Zephaniah three seventeen. The Lord mm-hmm. sings over us. Yes. yes. And I mean, that's absolutely my favorite verse yeah. because, I mean, it says the Lord is a warrior. And so you have this singing warrior who's mighty to save that sings over me. Mm-hmm. You know what? Yep. Mm-hmm. What humility that that brings. Yeah. But also I love, Rhonda, that you brought out like the different types of songs there. Because no matter what we're going through, like you said, the dirges, mm-hmm. even that word, right? Mm-hmm. Like dirge. just dirt. I mean, it's it sounds mournful, and mm-hmm. it is. And so... Whatever we are going through, it could be a joyful, we just saw a miracle of the Lord and he killed our enemies, um, to a lament and a dirge and, you know, and everything in between as well, whatever emotion um, that we go through. Catherine, why don't you share about what our um, Lifeway Women Academy talked about, the reason for poetry? Yeah, so we just finished um, poetry as as, um, in the Old Testament, Psalms. what were all the books? Lamentations, mm-hmm. anyway, a Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, yeah. and um, the purpose for poetry and for beauty, that God is not only like a, he's, he's drawing us to himself through beauty, and what a kind God to woo us mm-hmm. <laughs> in that way, and what a kind God to also allow us to co-create. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. we can, mm-hmm. we talked, we've talked about this in the worship ministry. When we see God for who He is, our natural response is worship, and they got to see God as this deliverer, which He is, and their response was worship. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can express ourselves to God in worship and he just gives us the and there's many ways to worship other than just music but the the privilege of singing Mm -hmm. you know and even if you can't sing it's still pretty to jesus terry jolly will tell you that (laughs) um but but yeah just he gives us beauty he gives us um just why pretty flowers I ran this morning and I smelled the honeysuckle mm-hmm. and I'm, you know I mean mm-hmm. just the sweetness of the honeysuckle mm-hmm. the the beauty in nature all of these things and it's all to point us to him not as an iron-fisted you know I'm mighty and you must follow me which is how uh, sometimes we so often think of God but as a a wooing God who yes. who wants to draw us to him in his beauty yes. mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting, right? Right after the worship is the complaining. Yes. <laughs> 1524, the people grumbled. That could we, sum up everything. Absolutely. Yeah. They hit traffic after church. Yeah. On the way home. A long way to the restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, we were thirsty. and But yeah, but no, there are three days. Hello, once again, mm-hmm. three days um, in the wilderness and there's no water. Mm-hmm. And they came upon it and it's bitter. And... Um, and so they're like, what What are we going to drink? You know, and so, yeah, I think it's very interesting and very telling of humanity that after the worship usually comes complaining. Yeah. And so after seeing a miracle of God that we go back, we forget, quote unquote, um, the theme of remembering here. But, um, but yeah, and then the Lord gives them water mm-hmm. and once again shows his might over creation and shows another miracle Um, that water that was bitter is now sweet. Um, So very, very interesting. And it's a piece of wood. Mm. Isn't that interesting? interesting? Mm. I have got a trivia. Just trivia. This is just trivia. (laughs) Um, Mara. Now, when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. What did Naomi (laughs) tell everyone to call her? Mara. <laughs> yes. And Ruth, um, uh, it says, but she said, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Mm-hmm. That's just a little trivia. I love it. That's great. <laughs> great connector. Good, good, good. I love how we see this one last thing, this last verse at the end of chapter 15, uh, where we see God bring them to a place of restoration and rest, even after they had complained. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we see the Lord's kindness to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Mm. All right, chapter 16. Chapter 16. So, bread from heaven. Um, another really exciting part of Exodus. So, um, I like to try to keep a timeline. This is two and a half months after the Israelites had left Egypt. They come to the wilderness of sin and grumbled against Moses and Aaron because they were hungry. 
The Lord promises um, bread from heaven with specific instructions to follow for gathering it. Moses and Aaron speak to the people about God's provision, which will be meat in the evening and bread in the morning, and tell them that their complaints are really against the Lord. The Lord sends quail in the evening and bread in the morning to fill them so that they will know that I am the Lord. Again, he's their provider. The Israelites name the mystery bread manna, which means what is it? Um, which is what we said in the cafeteria at school, right? Um, they get further specific commands on the daily gathering of manna. Some violated the command not to let any of it remain until morning, disobeying the Lord and angering Moses. God introduces the concept of the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week. Some of the Israelites disobeyed the Sabbath command, so the Lord told them that no one was to leave their place. They were to rest. They were sentenced to house arrest, basically. The Lord commands them to preserve two quarts of manna uh, as a testimony to future generations. So what have they been eating for two and a half months? That's my question. The livestock they took with them? That's, That's what I'm wondering. Know. I know. And they're just out of food now because, I mean, they're, you're talking about a million plus people. Yeah. So. Goat sandwiches? Yeah. I don't, <laughs> yeah. Berries. Berries. I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, they're know. in the wilderness, well, there's, right? But there's not much water out there, so yeah. there's probably not a lot growing. Yeah. Verse, Interesting. Verse 3, chapter 16, cracks me up. If only we had died by the Lord's <laughs> hand in the land of Egypt. Okay, in the land of Egypt where they were slaves. That's correct. When we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. So evidently, rather than actually making bricks, they were just sitting around big old pots of meat. Eating. But you know, how very, how very yeah. human of Oh, yeah, them. absolutely. Yeah. How often, always look back and yes. remember things better than they were. How often when we've exactly. been in our own lives and we've got to tried to pull us out of something that was not good for us That's right. and we're but we're not yet where he we're going so we're in that wilderness we're in that in between we've come out but we're not yet there you know and mm-hmm. so but we look back and we're tempted to go back absolutely oh my goodness absolutely yeah. I often think about that just in in our lives personally like we were when I lived in Las Vegas it was peak of Vegas I mean it, you know at that time and it was um, things were happening. I mean, you're talking about 2,500 people a, a day moving into the city, and it was just pivotal. The church that we were a part of, literally, the first Sunday I was there, it was about it was less than a year old. There was about 120 people. Our last Sunday at that church was 2,500. It was their fifth wow. anniversary service. And so you talk about lots of growing pains and a lot of growth, but a lot of excitement about what God had been doing and was doing and continuing to do. And so to this day, sometimes we look back, Corey and I will talk and we're like, was it as good as we remember? (laughs) You know, like, man, it was good days. You know, those were fun days. And then we were like, you know what? We also learned that the Lord works in spite of people, you know? (laughs) And so, no, they were not all great days. And so I absolutely relate to... The Israelites here, because you do. I mean, there's and there's days here too, you know, in our lives that's not necessarily um, back that far ago, you know, 15, 20 years ago. But of man, it was good back then. Oh, yeah. But don't you remember? Oh yeah, we were slaves. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like oh, I forget about that one about, little detail. Yeah, yeah, I forgot about yeah. this. And so it's so interesting mm-hmm. um, how human nature is, and we have not changed. Yeah, we have not. No, changed. we have not. <laughs> um, I was a little confused because Numbers talks about um, the manna and the quail also, and I'm thinking, is that you know? But evidently, the quail was just a one day thing here. Mm-hmm. And then when we get to numbers, it, it was like, are right, you going to complain about meat? I'm going to give you some meat. And lots of it. There came the meat. So this was just a one night. Hey, we're tired. You know, we want bread and meat. And so he gave some, gives them the bread. The manna, manna keeps going. The quail was the for quail one doesn't. day until we get up t- to numbers just to clear up somebody's That's confusion good. because yeah. I, I, I was confused about that. Um, numbers also gives us an, a, a more description of manna, a little bit more in depth. Manna resembled coriander seed in the shape, but not the color. That's what okay. I have learned. Um, and its appearance was like that of dillium, which is white. Um, and they ground it in a pair of grinding stones and crushed it in mortar, then boiled it in a cooking pot. It tasted like a pastry cooked in the finest oil. Ooh. That tells me Krispy Kreme. that it was a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> Thinking Krispy Kreme donuts, glazed the warm donuts are falling every morning. You wake up and you're mm-hmm. surrounded by 
the hot light is on. I, I believe that does say that carbs are from the Lord. Absolutely. Like that is what they this are, is saying. And to you me. must, you must say <laughs> it, it is sweet, it is tasty, it is a, a pastry boiled in the finest oil. I mean, that is Krispy Kreme. Like amazing. something like Triscuits that's like wholesome. Yeah. That doesn't really taste good though, but it's fiber like, muffin. Mm-hmm. Fiber yeah. muffins. <laughs> or those and no. or those gluten free mm-hmm. little crackers that we get it for no. the Lord's no. supper. <laughs> Have no flavor. They taste like popcorn, you know, the styrofoam. styrofoam. Yeah, that's what they taste like. Um, I did a little figuring. Two quarts of manna per person per day, okay, for two million to two point five million people. That's nine million pounds or forty five hundred tons of manna per day. Wow. A million tons annually for forty years. Not about that. falling in a specific place mm. Every at a day. specific time. Well, six days. Six days a week in a planned time. And then twice that mm-hmm. on yes. day six. Yes, they am day six. Yeah, I mean planned wow. intervals in a in a specific place. There are books that try to make this seem like some kind of natural something. This was not a natural occurrence. No, this was a supernatural occurrence. Um, God always calls manna bread. Mm-hmm. The Israelites always call it manna. The only time God calls it manna is one time when he's quoting them, the talking about manna. Um, it's bread. What is the, mm-hmm. you know, what's the, the idiom for bread in the Bible? You know, bread is usually the word of God. Mm-hmm. Who is the word of God? That's Christ. He is mm-hmm. the bread of life. Mm-hmm. I mean, manna is representation, a representation of Christ. Mm-hmm comes out every day. We need it every day. We have to get it ourselves. Yes. We cannot get it for That's anyone right. else. No one else can get it for us. Mm-hmm. Yep. So this, many. This day, give us daily. this day our daily bread. bread. Mm-hmm. I, love, daily. I love the dailiness of it. That dependence. Like that, mm-hmm. they could not, and they tried, <laughs> as we read, they tried not to be daily dependent on God for that manna, but he set up a system in his wisdom to build that in them Mm -hmm. and with all of our modern conveniences it's so very easy for us not to be daily dependent on god that's right Mm -hmm. but the same still holds true for us and we so easily forget that it did not fall in their mouths yeah no they they had had to to, go take it and they had to humble themselves bend over yeah and pick it up Mm -hmm. because it it was on the ground because it was on the ground but it Mm -hmm. tasted good it tasted like like ice cream god. (laughs) so (laughs) Yep. Okay, but the word of the Lord is sweet, you know, and, right. and, and, and so it's tasting, yep. taste and see. Taste <laughs> yes. yeah. right. It's I, interesting, too. Their clothes and their shoes didn't wear out. Yeah. Okay. We find that, that out later. To me, manna is like, I mean, especially it tastes like a Krispy Kreme. I mean, that's like a, he could have made it where they weren't hungry. Mm-hmm. If he true. could make their shoes and their clothes not wear out, mm-hmm. they could have gone the entire time without hunger. Mm-hmm. If, if that. Right you know was his decision but that was a that was a gift to them Mm -hmm. that that they could use to sustain themselves in that way and and i think probably it was another way of him being provisional for them and them having to depend on him because if you don't have a hunger then you don't need someone to give you food that's right but if you have a hunger every day that you have to fulfill yes then you have to go you have to look for the provider right. of that, mm-hmm. you know. I think it's interesting, too, that, of course, we we mentioned this earlier. The sixth day, they gather twice as much food because the seventh day, like, hey, don't, you know, you're going to you're going to rest. Um, the um, it's a Sabbath to the Lord, first of all, is the phrasing. Um, and they don't they don't know rest. Like they they don't what is rest what they, what is that because they've been slaves remember in their past and so I don't think Pharaoh gave them a day of rest no <laughs> no. no and and so it's saying okay you know the Lord has given you the Sabbath and so this is the first kind of mention of rest and a first and then I love verse thirty it says so the people rested <laughs> holy cow do we need that do we need to remember that rest is a gift that God is provisional. And we are dependent upon him for actual rest and what that means. And we could do a whole podcast episode on what that means. But but of the command, I mean, it is a command to rest. 
We are given limitations yes, for a reason. Absolutely. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it I believe it is so that we become dependent on the Lord. We're mm-hmm. saying, Okay, Lord, I I trust you. I, for six days I will do my work. I will I will gather. I will do things, of course, as you allow and you know, and still God is provisional, right? And God is still um sovereign there. And then on the seventh, you know what? You're still working, Lord, but I don't have to. And what a gift that is. Um, and that's not saying, you know, like to lay around and, and do nothing. Like, you know, typically a Sabbath, maybe for, for some of us, is to come to church and to serve and to worship together for community and, and things like that. And so, but of resting, of what does that look like? And we have lost the gift of rest. Yes. <laughs> Our culture does not um, see that as beneficial. We believe um, that we should work so that we can rest, and it's not that way. It's we rest even though our to-do list is not done. Uh, we rest even though the work is not finished. Um, and so, yeah. So this is where they are first hearing about that, and it's like, I, and of course, the Lord is gracious in giving them more information uh, later on. We'll see in a few chapters, but um, yeah. The, so the people rested. Very interesting. Very good. Very needed. All right. Uh, and they ate that. They ate manna for 40 years. Yep. How about eating the same thing every day for 40 years? If it was a Krispy Kreme donut, I could probably manage. I think after that, I still might be. <laughs> I might be a little done with it. But you know what? They do complain. So here you go. Um, but anyways. Um, uh, real quick, too. They, there are a couple of verses. It, there's one, I think, in Exodus and a couple of numbers that talks about when the, they left, they took some, and my version says riffraff with them. I love okay? that. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm sure there were some people who were in Egypt who were desperate to get out because yes. things were not going well there. So this dude's winning. Moses is winning. I'm going with him. In Numbers, it says the riffraff were tired of the manna. And they, and then, and the Israelites complained about wanting meat when God gave them the the quail day after day after day. He gave them Mm -hmm. the quail at that point. But it was interesting to me that it started, the verse started out as the riffraff were complaining about the lack of variety in the food. And so you wonder, I wonder if God's going, don't bring them with you. Mm. You know, I mean, I just mm. wonder if that was, and this is, you know, probably off topic here, mm-hmm. but but I don't know. They, it, mm-hmm. It's so easy to let someone who may not necessarily be walking with the Lord to speak into you. Absolutely. To make you feel like God's not doing enough for you. That's discontent. so good, Rhonda. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah, just there's some, di- yeah. In your heart. Well, you Absolutely. know, I thought God loved you. Why yeah. would he let this happen to you if they, if God, if, you know, I, you know, look how well they're doing over there and, and God's not blessing you mm-hmm. in that way or, you know, and, and so I, I just, that, that was another interesting little rabbit trail that I, that I chased when I was looking at manna in numbers and it was talking about how the riffraff or in another um, translation was the mixed company. Interesting. So it was Israelites versus non-Israelites was the only thing mm-hmm. that I got from that. But I somewhere heard some commentary about that it was an ethnically diverse group that left Egypt. Mm-hmm. So it was not definitely not only the Israelites. Right. But I know we see in mm-hmm. like the details that are given for participating in the Passover that foreigners can participate, but they must be circumcised. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so there's that covenant. They have to be within the covenant mm-hmm. to participate. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, Which we're foreigners. Exactly. We're right. 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 We but that's, are foreigners. But and that's so kind of a interesting picture of that. Yes. That's kind of a picture of that talks about in the New Testament that being grafted in. That's right. To the that's family right. of God. Exactly. Yeah. They are, they can be grafted in. It yes. is possible. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, that's good. All right. Chapter 17. Chapter Ooh. 17. Um, so two big things here. We get water from the rock, and we have a battle, our first battle. So they leave the wilderness of sin and journey to, I'm going to call it Ref- Rephidim. They complain there that there is no water to drink, more grumbling. I sense a theme. 
Uh, Moses cries out to the Lord and he answers and tells Moses to strike the rock and he will give them water. And so that is what happens there. Then the Amalekites attack the Israelites. We see Joshua for the first time as an assistant to Moses and Joshua leads the fight. The Israelites prevail as long as Moses holds up his hands. When Moses grows weary, Aaron and her assist Moses in supporting his hands. Um, the Israelites prevail and God promises to completely blot out uh, the memory of Amalek. And then Moses builds an altar and names it, the Lord is my banner, he worships. Mm, that's good. So water, yeah. out of a rock. Out of a rock. Rephidim was a dry place. There, was, there had never been water there. And when they wandered back there later, they will wander back to this same spot. Mm-hmm. There's Think no about water there again. Water for this many people. Right. This isn't mm-hmm. just like, yeah. you know, when you drive to the mountains and you see a little stream coming <laughs> yes. out of there, a little rock on the side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's no way that sufficed for this yeah. many people. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. In verse 11 of that same chapter, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. Mm. Which is just amazing, I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, to me. Um, Water can represent the Holy Spirit, Mm. often in the Bible. Um, So they have, the rock is struck, the rock is to be struck once. The next time they come to the rock, the rock is to not be struck, mm-hmm. just to be spoken. And Moses didn't get the didn't get that right. <laughs> but um, is that a representative of Christ smitten once and for all? I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. you could read that into that, I guess, if you wanted to. But um, the rock is smitten once, and the water flows from the rock. And definitely, there's another thing that we see throughout the entire books of the Bible, this theme of water and mm-hmm. and the, how it cleanses us mm-hmm. and That's how good. Jesus is, you know, as he was the water that you will never thirst again. Mm-hmm. The, living the, the living water. The living water. Yeah. That's right. I have in my notes, so just as I was reading this, is water, the lack of water represents, of course, a lack that mm-hmm. they have. Um, but if you look at verse 7, the end of that, I think, is very telling because it says, uh, the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? It's not necessarily the lack of water. It's their questioning his presence. Hmm. And I think that's really where <laughs> where the Lord's like, all right, you know, here comes, a, here comes an enemy. <laughs> because it's like, I need to show you once again mm-hmm. that I am with you. Mm-hmm. I Here's water from a rock, you know, and here, like, Yes, I am with you, and I will always be with you. Um, that, and it, it's very interesting. Um, in the notes in our uh, my little study Bible, it says the water, the, this water specifically. Um, I'm sorry. The notes in my study Bible says elsewhere Horeb, which is the rock at Horeb, is called the mountain of God. Hence, the water flows from God's mountain, the place of God's presence. And then the end of that verse of seven says, is the Lord among them? So they are quest- they are really questioning God's presence here. Mm-hmm. So it's more than just a physical need. It is, God, are you even with us? Because we feel like you have left. Mm-hmm. So an interesting commentary thing that I came across is that there are three tests for Israel in the wilderness. And there are tests for Jesus in the wilderness. Ooh. Israel does not pass. And of course, Jesus does. But the, the three tests that they line out, water from the rock is actually the third. The manna test was the second. And then the, I believe the water at Mara was the first. The bitter water, water from the rock, water at Mara, Stick. from heaven. Yes, the bitter water is the first. And so I thought, mm-hmm. what an interesting, this is like, they. my commentary calls it wilderness university. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and so uh, you know all this complaining and grumbling and questioning God and doubting His provision mm, yes. is is interesting. It shows so much of our humanness and how we That's right. are so imperfect in how we understand and trust God. 
but then in Jesus, when he went to the wilderness to be tested, yes. how he responded perfectly mm -hmm. to those challenges. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was yeah, a really good. interesting parallel. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe if, and again, I may be stretching this, but if, if, if that water that God is flowing out over them rep, does represent the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. okay? And then as soon as they receive that, they are immediately tested. Absolutely. You know, when, so what if this sort of, you could use it as an analogy of our flesh versus our spirit mm -hmm. and how until we receive the Holy Spirit from God, we don't, ha we don't wrestle with our flesh. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, we, we don't. We there's do, no battle. There's yeah. no battle there, <laughs> right? But once we have that spirit, we are, we are a new creation, but we don't molt like a crab and leave the old one behind right. you know what I mean we have to carry that flesh mm -hmm. and those fleshly desires with us and um, we have to you know that's why we have to take captive every thought that's why we have to right. try to strive mm -hmm. to have the mind of Christ because mm -hmm. we do battle with that flesh with that right. old Adam you know on the uh, mm -hmm. every day I think um, it's a picture of like sanctification like we see the justification through their deliverance through the Red Sea mm -hmm. Just like we were saved at the moment of, of our conversion, we are saved and justified, but we're not yet sanctified. Mm -hmm. And we won't be fully sanctified until mm -hmm. we see Jesus face to face, but we're always in process. Right. And I feel like that's such a picture of what's happening here. Well, they'd never battled before. They'd never had to fight mm -hmm. anyone, you know, Absolutely. In, in Egypt. Uh, interesting to me, Amalek is Esau's grandson. Mm. Which I did not know, but yes. that gives us a, that makes sense. Gives us a, a little picture all in the family of the, <laughs> yes. the, of the all ugly family, family tree that we have going yes. on there. What I've always wondered is in that fight, why is Moses' arm so important? <laughs> because it's um, also a spiritual battle. Yes. Yeah. Well, and that's um, in this little notes here. It says the word banner, which is ness. Uh, refers to a battle standard, a flag, or insignia that leads an army into war. Perhaps Moses' raised arms are symbolic of raising Yahweh. Y'all should know that name mm -hmm. right now. Their banner, quote-unquote, of military strength and power. With mm -hmm. the banner raised, the army prevails. Mm -hmm. And I love how he requires assistance. Yes. That he, his, his community <laughs> comes in when he is tired yes and assists him yes they can't stand in for him specifically it has to be his hands that are raised That's but right. they come in and prop him up yes. and enable him to per, to persevere yeah um, enter Jethro and so let's move on to chapter 18 <laughs> yes. that's a great segue it keeps Catherine. getting good yes 18. Here we go. Moses' father-in-law. Jethro makes a reappearance. Also Moses' wife, Zipporah, and the two sons come to the Israelites in the wilderness. Uh, Moses relays to Jethro. So there's like the first evangelism here, I think. Uh, to Jethro, all that the Lord has done for them. And Jethro's heard. Jethro rejoices and worships the Lord. Um, as Moses is judging the people, Jethro notices that it is too much for Moses and tells him to select men and teach them God's statutes and delegate authority to judge over smaller groups of Israelites so that Moses only gets the most difficult cases and preserves his resources. Moses wisely listens to his father-in-law and then Jethro leaves and goes back to his own land. Okay, I did not realize until again listening to Cindy read that Moses' wife and kids were not with him this whole time. Mm -hmm. What? Where have you been, Zipporah? Okay, well, oh. yeah, you've been with Jethro. So that she makes sense. She wasn't happy with him. Mm. I mean, if you go back and look, mm -hmm. I went back and read a little bit about her. Please do. Okay, share well, about Zipporah. back in chapter 4, God had was coming, and he's going to kill Moses. He right. was coming because I'm going to kill you. I'm, I, he was evidently sick in the bed and had gotten an illness that God had struck him with because he had not circumcised his son it, assuming the younger one but it, we don't really know for mm -hmm. sure um, he was so weak that he couldn't do it physically at this point right but he had not done it because the Midianites don't do that his right. wife Zipporah you know her dad she, the priest of Midian mm -hmm. those people didn't do that kind of thing so she ended up having to do it herself or she was gonna lose Moses mm -hmm. she took a rock, <laughs> circumcised her son, and then threw it 
the foreskin yes. at his feet, his feet. <laughs> and said, you are now a blood husband. What a moment. And that is the last we see of her <laughs> until Jethro well. brings her back with him after he's heard about everything that's going on in Egypt. Things were not happy between them, I don't think. I, do, I think. you know, I think the Lord was upset with him because he had not done what they had been charged to do since Abraham. Every male had to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. And now he's married her and her, you know, assuming it could be the oldest, I don't know, but the, assuming that either one of these maybe, but it talk, just talks about her circumcising one of them. Mm -hmm. Could have been the baby boy. Mm -hmm. Mama didn't want to do that to her baby boy. <laughs> but um, so at that point, she goes back with Jethro, mm -hmm. and we don't even see her again. In mm -hmm. fact, we don't even get the name of that younger boy's, we don't get the younger boy's name until mm -hmm. at this point in mm -hmm. chapter 18. So um, her body language <coughs> was not, <laughs> was not good the last time we see her with him. But don't you suppose, too, though, that even though that's the situation that, that, that she was angry with Moses, probably Moses did not need a wife to take care of a wife during this time period, uh, when, particularly when he, he was in Egypt trying to get Pharaoh to listen to him. I mean, Moses yeah. had a lot on his plate. He had his hands full. Yeah. He had I don't his, know. You know, I, I was thinking about that, and I agree. It's hard to know if that was the way, just the way God wanted it to be, and that's why she wasn't there. Or maybe it would have been her singing that song maybe. in 50, in Gen, mm -hmm. you know, in Exit, rather maybe than Mary. You know, I mean, yes, Mar maybe yes. she missed out on a blessing that's because right. she was, a, you know, I just. Because I, she was mad. Because she was mad and didn't, you know, but I mean, and, and ugly about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, but. I don't know. It's it's one of those mysteries mm -hmm. of, of where what would her role have been in mm -hmm. that. I think really the focus of this chapter and this section is Jethro and Moses's relationship, and Moses respected Jethro enough to listen to him and to. I love you know what he says in verse seventeen. Jethro says. What you're doing is not good. <laughs> Jethro you, is a truth teller. Yes. You're yes. like, you are going to wear yourself out. We um, need truth tellers in our yes, lives. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. He said, the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. <laughs> I will give you counsel and God be with you. <laughs> I think we should all preface our counsel with that, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you my opinion but and God, with, mm -hmm. God be with you. But you should represent the people before God and you should bring their cases before God. That's in um, 1819. Um, and so he tells them, you know, hey, this is a way to do this and basically to teach others to lead and teach others to help you and to delegate and to, uh, but then he goes on to say, you know, here are prerequisites, basic qualifications, you know, mm -hmm. look for able men among the people. They fear God. They're trustworthy. They hate dishonest gain. Um, and then set them over, you know, all of these groups of people. And so basically what he's saying is like, Jethro, this is, or Moses, this is not sustainable for you. The way that you're leading these, this million plus people, this is not sustainable. And here's what you need to do. And that was when Corey and I went to counseling last year, um, all the pastors and the wives were able to go to this really special in-depth counseling, um, week-long counseling opportunity. And that was the big question of our week was, is your pace sustainable? Is what you're doing sustainable? And so this speaks very highly to what I learned that week of, of I felt like I was delegating some, but not everything. And, and how personal this means, you know, even mm -hmm. in leadership. And I've got to say, even in our homes, ladies, are you delegating chores? Are you delegating things that your three-year-old can do? Are you delegating things that your 18-year-old can do? Are you, uh, or does it have to be just so-so and you're such a control freak that you don't mm -hmm. want anybody else to do it? Well, Take that's it. a whole other counseling <laughs> podcast that we need to, yeah. Get off my toes. I know. <laughs> and, I mean, it's the same thing. And so it's, this, these are things that I'm learning. I'm just, you know, I'm just sharing that these are the things that I'm continuing to learn too is we're leaders wherever we are. And so are we able to delegate? Are we teaching our children, hey, mom can do it all and just let me do it? Um, like Moses was, and he was saying, I'm going to do all this, you know, or are we saying, you know what, I trust these, this task to you, 
and what encouragement that is for the people, right? What encouragement that is for those Mm -hmm. leaders. Um, I see something in you that you can do this task. Um, And that's handing it off also to another generation, to that next generation. And so, but what you're doing right now is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And how do you make it? How do you change it from not sustainable to sustainable? And that's a personal question that you get to answer and that you get to wrestle with the Lord on. But I just, I love this. I love that Moses, first of all, listens to Jethro and that Jethro comes to him with just such good advice. And then he just disappears. Like he just leaves, you know, he's like comes in, has his words of wisdom and then moves on. Well, he does. He definitely does advise him that way, but he also puts a, a little, um, what's the word I want to use? I'm not sure. He wants to be sure that God's also in on this because he says, if you do this thing and God commands you, then you will be able to endure. He's not just, Jethro knows that God's got to put his stamp of approval on that. Mm-hmm. So, All right, chapter 19. Chapter 19. Again, let's back on our timeline. Three months from the day that the Israelites left Egypt, they arrive at the Sinai wilderness and camped in front of Mount Sinai. We are being set up. For the Ten Commandments, y'all. God speaks to Moses on the mountain and tells him that he is going to give the Israelites a covenant, that they will be his own people, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. God tells Moses what to say to the Israelites. So Moses takes that to the elders and then to all the people. All the people responded together that they would obey the Lord. <clears throat> the Lord speaks to Moses again and tells him he is going to come in a dense cloud. Um Moses repeats to the Lord the the people's commitment of obedience. The Lord tells Moses to consecrate the people over the next three days, in three days, and put boundaries around the mountain. Uh, Moses obeys and the people obey. On the third day, God descends in a thick cloud with thunder and lightning, fire and smoke. Moses brings the people out of the camp to meet God at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain shakes violently. Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. Um, God reminds Moses to remind the people not to break through the boundary. He does this twice to try and see the Lord. Um, And then God tells Moses to go down and return with Aaron, and Moses obeys. Really? I mean, this is, again, specific words from the Lord of what to do and what not to do. Um, Something that's very interesting, we kind of were setting up for the Ten Commandments, but uh, in my Old Testament class, it was the professor said that other religions in this day in this uh, time of exodus they were desiring to know what their god wanted from them or wanted for them what what were their desire was what do you need us to do what do you want us to do and they were just living in this unsettledness the unsureness of we don't know because our, our god little g god has not spoken to us and here the Lord is giving them very detailed instruction and is building them up towards the Ten Commandments, which you'll we'll later see in next chapter. But I just think that's so interesting is that that God loves his his people, his chosen um, people. And here in verse uh, six, he says, You shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. That should sound familiar yes. too. Um, but he, you know, he's saying, he's like, you know, I want you to know me first of all and i want you to know how i want you to live so this is again god's grace and god's mercy and when we look at all of these rules and things like that it's like no that's that's god's grace that's god's mercy his boundary saying i am holy this chapter if i just boil it down to one word it's holiness He's yes. saying, I am holy, and you can only come so far. You can only see so much of me before before you die. <laughs> like, you can only see so much. Mm-hmm. And what I love is that Moses is here saying, like, God is holy. Like, there has to be some respect. There has to be some reverence. There's some awe here. And the Lord's, because of the Lord's holiness and his set-apartness, We see the thunder, the lightning, the thick cloud, the blast of a trumpet. Once again, that should bring some Mm -hmm. familiarity there. Revelation 4. Yes. Um, And it says, Moses brought the people out of the camp in verse 17 to meet God. 
they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Um, and Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the fire, ha- the Lord had descended on it. Like, it is just this, this really cool movie scene. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is yeah. dramatic. Yeah. That's yeah. dramatic. Dramatic because it's the holiness of God. Well, and they had to be consecrated. They had yes. to be all this washing, all of this stuff and, before this, and then no sexual relations. I mean, they. Mm-hmm. They could not just casually approach God. That's right. That's right. Um, and I love it how it says, you know, um, Moses said to the Lord, the people are not permitted to come up. So for yourself, you know, you yourself warned us, uh, set limits around the mountain and keep it holy. Moses is saying, we want to keep this holy. Like we, you know, I'm in awe of you and who you are in your um, all togetherness. And so we're just, we're wanting to keep it Keep it holy. reminds them not to break through that boundary twice. Yeah. Like, they knew probably in their humanness that they would be curious, mm-hmm. of course. But Absolutely. Think about, the, think about the might that they see from God in this manifestation of what he shows them, and then the might they saw from God coming through the Red Sea. And this is only three months later. Wow, that's wow, true. Wow, you know. Yeah. That's good, Catherine. It's the burning bush on a... <gasps> yes. Huge, <laughs> massive scale. You know, it's On like, steroids. Yeah, it's like, okay, you thought that was something. Watch this mountain shake. Just, you know, yes. I mean, it's it's crazy. Yes. Ooh, so and good. the people, it just cracks me up. We will do what the Lord commands. <laughs> and then For a chapter. Oh, maybe. my goodness. Yes. Yeah, and then here we go. <laughs> All right, we well, go. let's lead into the Ten Commandments, chapter 20. Yes, chapter 20. So all I have in my notes is the Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> we're finally there. Um, and I'm not going to go into any detail because I'm sure we're going to talk through those. But um, all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning and the smoke on the mountain. They trembled and stood at a distance. They are afraid until Moses. Uh, they only want Moses to speak to them because if they think if God speaks to them, then they'll surely die. That's right. Um, Moses reassures them not to be afraid, but to know that God is testing them so they will not sin. Then Moses receives additional laws, a reiteration of the command for them not to make silver or gold idols, and some details for altar building. In this, God says, I will come to you and bless you in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. Well, I don't necessarily want us, because of time's sake, to walk all the way through the Ten Commandments, but does anybody have a favorite? (laughs) I will say the Ten Commandments seem to be a big culmination in Exodus. Yes. The Jewish calendar did not change when the Ten Commandments were delivered. Mm. The Jewish calendar changed when Passover, Passover. occurred. That's right. That's, That's good. the the defining moment of Exodus mm-hmm. for me. I mean, there yeah. are a thousand, but I mean, yeah. that's that's the climactic moment, That's you know, good. for me. Um, my, I don't know that it's it's not my favorite. It's just <laughs> the most um, peculiar to me, and that is. Uh, Tenth one, the last one. Mm. Do not covet your neighbor's health, wife, servant, donkeys, anything. Anybody's rules, any religion, anyone. That's the only thought commandment. It's it's a thought. It's an intent. It's not an action. Mm. Mm. How do you even intriguing punish mm-hmm. for that? Which is interesting because in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus takes the Ten Commandments and expounds them to, like, don't just do them outwardly, but don't also don't do them inwardly That's in right. your heart. And so, like, his intent is, like, also inward purity, but it's not maybe spelled out right. except in that last mm. right. That's good. Yeah. commandment. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's strictly a heart issue. Anybody so. have a favorite? Well, I'll comment on um, the honor your father and mother one. I recently was listening to someone commenting on the Ten Commandments, and they were talking about the importance of that and um, that it's right in the middle of the commandments. I mean, you can't really divide ten, right? I mean, but it's it's there right in the middle. That and, bothers me too. It, <laughs> but it, it uh, connects that family unit connects us to God and mm-hmm. to others. So um, in honoring the, uh, that, being sure that our family unit, how important the family unit is, mm-hmm. that we are to teach our children about um, the testaments of God. You know, he says that over and over. It's why they did the... Um, you know the sacrifices and the the um, 
um, the Passover. It, he kept saying that, so you will remember, so you will remember. So this family unit there is to teach the children about him mm -hmm. and then to connect us to other people uh, so that we can live civilly with others. Mm -hmm. You know, good. but it's That's right good. in the middle, yeah. and that and that it's a, an important spot for it to be. Well, the the punishment in Deuteronomy for a rebellious child was stoning to death, mm -hmm. and now and that's not we're not looking at a child here. We're looking at a grown mm -hmm. man who was repeatedly um, rebellious. And it says when it talks about the the law, it says. This is our son, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. um, there's no record in Jewish history of someone being stoned for being a rebellious child. So it may very well be a teaching r law, a rule that said, hey, this is what right. we could do. But doesn't it give the prodigal son additional meaning mm -hmm. when you look at it to say that the father could have had that son stoned to death. Wow. Yeah. He could have taken him, taken him out to the center of the town and said, he's rebellious, mm -hmm. he's blown his money, he's out doing wow. all this stuff. That's good. I could have him stoned, but instead he takes him in. There's more mm -hmm. And throws him a party. But, right, yeah, and mm -hmm. throws him a party and says, I've been waiting, I've been looking mm -hmm. for you, I've been waiting for you to come mm -hmm. back. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, when you look at it that way, when as Jesus teaching as a rabbi would have mm -hmm. known all of these laws and you right. know would have known all of this, the grace and the mercy that he's extended to the prodigal son at this point is astounding. Yeah, that's and that good. and that's us. Mm -hmm. You know, that is us. That we that should be stoned. That's good. And also honoring is not the same as obeying. No, you know, it's much it's bonded. so deeper and more beautiful mm -hmm. than just some type of obedience. It's mm -hmm. that's an inward. That's an inward thing. Again, mm -hmm. that's an inward thing more than just an outward obedience because mm -hmm. you can know we all know and your kids too like they can technically do what you've asked them to do right. like if you tell them to sit down they can sit down but you can tell by the look on their face that they're standing up on the inside <laughs> you know <laughs> and you know I mean you can get that way with if he had said obey yeah, yeah. you, you yeah, can get absolutely. legalistic with oh, it that's right well when uh, you, you look at at Romans 7, you know, you look at Matthew 5, the Sermon mm -hmm. on the Mount, you know, you think these are tough. Look at the way mm -hmm. Jesus describes them in Matthew, and then, you know, you'll see that they're tough. And yeah. it's just, you know, the, the law is there to show us our weakness, to show mm -hmm. us our need. That's right. You know, and, and obedience is there for us to show our love to him. Mm -hmm. That That's it. I mean, we, we, there's no way. If you look, we're, we're given the Ten Commandments. Immediately following that, what are we given? Mm -hmm. An altar because right. he knows we're going to mess up. He knows mm -hmm. we're going to need provision mm -hmm. to to take care of the times mm -hmm. that we fail in this. And so, you know, it to me, obedience, goodness, it's it's God. God has a claim on our life because He's our Creator. Mm -hmm. You know, He that alone is a, yeah. the claim a claim on their life. But when you look at the cost, okay, there the, he, He's our Creator. He's also our Redeemer. Mm -hmm. And the cross to be our redeemer was such was so heavy. Yeah. And, you know, it was much more costly for him as our redeemer than it was our creator. Mm -hmm. The creator, when he spoke to be our yeah. redeemer, he bled and died for yeah. us. You know, so that that's a double claim mm -hmm. on our obedience, mm -hmm. and that's not not to be legalistic or, or to be, you know, like that. That's to show love because mm -hmm. it was a show of yes. love to give us the law and it's a show of love for us to abide by it as best we can yeah. the law is for our flourishing mm -hmm. all right so the last um, thing i want to, to mention is verse 24 of chapter 20 and it says um, the lord is saying this this is in every place this is the last part of that verse in every place where i cause my name to be remembered i will come to you and bless you um I think that's a great place to end right there is um, is God mm -hmm. just talking about his altar and knowing what that will eventually mean is the cost of the one and only begotten son, Jesus, um, on on an altar. Very similar. And so, um, so yeah, well, thank you guys so much for being here today. We thank have you. we have dug the depths of Exodus 11 <laughs> through 20 and um, but it has been so much fun and so good and has definitely um, increased 
my knowledge for just being around you guys today. So we hope this has been fun for you listeners as well. And uh, join us um, next week for chapters 21 and 22. And we will continue on um, reading through this amazing book and see what else Moses has to deal with and what the Lord God does. And it's, it's going to be an incredible time. So thank you, Northside Women. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.